want to speak to you a little bit about um, the impact on abortion stigma on, on adolescents in particular, which is um, an area that my organization, the Center for Productive Rights, has worked on um, for quite a while now. So starting from a place of international human rights norms, um, they have clearly established that adolescents' right to health includes the right to sexual and reproductive health, including the right to control and make responsible choices about their bodies and access appropriate sexual and reproductive health services and information. So to comply with these standards, states must guarantee adolescents confidential, universal access to sexual and reproductive health services that enable them to make free and responsible decisions in accordance with their evolving capacities. To this end, adolescents must be able to access quality maternal health services, short and long-term contraceptive methods, emergency contraception, safe abortion, and post-abortion services. Despite these human rights protections, however, the realization of the right to sexual and reproductive health information and services remains elusive for most adolescents across the globe. In large part, this results from social norms stigmatizing not only uh, uh, adolescents' reproductive capacities, but also their sexuality. This therefore impacts their access to sexual reproductive health information and services. So the belief that adolescent or unmarried persons should not be sexually active uh, and the stereotype that adolescents lack the requisite maturity, capacity, or responsibility to consent to engage in sexual activity often influences lawmakers and also healthcare providers to deny access uh, to sexual reproductive health care services to adolescents. When adolescents are denied this right, um, it act either in law or in practice, it institutionalizes these and, stigma and continues to stigmatize uh, this behavior and these beliefs and reinforces social norms, thereby, again, perpetuating stigma surrounding adolescent sexuality. The stigma is felt particularly by adolescent girls, uh, who must also contend with discriminatory beliefs specific to female sexuality and stereotypes of females as mothers and caretakers. These stereotypes and beliefs can create a climate where women and adolescent girls are only supposed to be sexually active for the purpose of becoming pregnant and participating in sexual and participating in sexual activity outside of that context is considered inherently wrong. So the stigma surrounding adolescents' access to sexual reproductive health care services is particularly strong in the context of abortion. Adolescent girls may be blamed for becoming pregnant, or the decision to terminate a pregnancy may result in girls being ostracized for not conforming to a prescribed gender role as mother. Restrictive abortion laws also perpetuate both the stigma surrounding abortion as well as the belief that women and girls are not competent decision makers uh, to make autonomous decisions about their bodies and their health. These laws also reinforce the discriminatory notion that women's primary role is caretaking and motherhood. For many girls, carrying a pregnancy to term means foregoing their educational or employment opportunities and their ability to participate in public and political life. As such, the stigma surrounding adolescent sexuality and female sexuality and abortion all exacerbate one another in ways that seriously impair adolescent girls' ability to exercise their reproductive rights. The Center for Reproductive Rights has litigated several cases of the international human rights bodies involving the impact of restrictive abortion laws on adolescents' human rights. These cases have all demonstrated that restrictive abortion laws create a climate of fear, harassment, and intimidation, which not only precludes women and girls from making autonomous decisions about their sexual and reproductive health, but also denies them from accessing abortion services, even in the limited grounds where uh, abortion is legal. So, for example, in the first case that we litigated, KL in Peru, before the Human Rights Committee, this involved the denial of abortion services to an adolescent who was pregnant with an encephalic fetus, meaning that large parts of the fetus's brain and skull did not develop, and there was no chance of, of survival after birth. KL was forced to carry the pregnancy to term and to breastfeed the baby over the course of the four days in which it survived. The Human Rights Committee determined that the physical and mental pain suffered by KL, endured as a result of being denied abortion services, amounted to a violation of her right to be free from cruel and degrading treatment 
and also constituted an arbitrary interference with her private life. Recognizing KL's special vulnerability as a minor and the state's failure to provide her with necessary medical and psychological support, the Human Rights Committee also found that the state violated her right to special measures as a minor. The next case that we worked on was LCV3, which was before the CDOT Committee in which they found that the denial of abortion services to a minor violated the rights to health, non-discrimination, and freedom for, from sex role stereotyping, gender stereotyping. Elsie was just 13 when she became pregnant as a result of rape, and she attempted to commit suicide, which resulted in severe spinal injuries. Upon arriving at the hospital, Elsie was refused urgently needed spinal surgery because the doctors feared it may jeopardize her pregnancy. Although LC was eventually able to undergo spinal surgery, it was delayed for several months until she suffered a miscarriage and was no longer pregnant, leaving her paralyzed. In recognition of the fact that it's discriminatory for a state to refuse to legally provide for the performance of certain reproductive health services for women, and that states must eliminate discrimination against women in the field of health care and ensure men and women access health care services on a basis of equality, the CDOT committee found Peru in violation of the right to health and non-discrimination. The CDOT committee also found a violation of the right to be free from sex role stereotyping, as the decision to postpone the surgery due to her pregnancy was influenced by the stereotype that protection of the fetus should prevail over the health of the mother. Lastly, in our most recent case, um, in the case of PNSV Poland, uh, in the European Court of Human Rights. This case addressed the special vulnerability of a minor uh, in need of abortion services. P was only 14 years old when she became pregnant as a result of rape, under which circumstances abortion is legal in Poland, yet she was repeatedly denied legal, uh, legal abortion services. Uh, as hospital staff, anti-choice protesters, and clergy members uh, intentionally obstructed her access to such services and uh, she was subject to harassment and intimidation. In finding the ordeal amounted to inhumane and degrading treatment, the court stated that his age was of incredible importance to the case, and that throughout the ordeal, there was no proper regard for her vulnerability and young age, and her, as well as her views and her feelings. Furthermore, although P and her mother were in agreement about the decision to seek an abortion service, to seek abortion services, the court noted that legal guardianship cannot be considered to automatically confer on the parents of the minor the right to take decisions concerning the minor's reproductive choices, because proper regard must be had to the minor's personal autonomy in this sphere. So the denial of legal abortion services frequently results from the stigma that attaches to the abortion in general, which makes healthcare providers wary of authorizing abortion or willing to obstruct access to it. Abortion stigma can instill embarrassment and fear into individuals seeking abortion services, thereby preventing them in practice from actually accessing those services. These denials of abortion services in, in turn reinforce abortion stigma by making women who need abortion services feel as though they have done something wrong. Furthermore, they perpetuate the stereotype that women and girls who become pregnant should sacrifice their health and their lives and their opportunities in the interest of preserving the fetus. In addition to restrictive abortion laws, parental and spousal consent requirements for abortion services perpetuate the stigma surrounding abortion and prevent adolescents from autonomously deciding whether to carry a pregnancy to term. Although some countries require spousal or parental authorization for all services, more frequently, these are only attached to abortion services. By enacting procedural barriers specific to abortion services, abortion is set apart from other health services, which reinforce the idea that there is something different, inherently wrong, or questionable about the decision to terminate the pregnancy. Similar to restriction abortion, restrictive abortion laws, parental and spousal authorization requirements perpetuate the belief that adolescents are not autonomous individuals that are capable of making responsible decisions about their sexual and reproductive health. Adolescents may not want to include their parents in decisions regarding their sexual and reproductive health for a number of reasons. Stigma surrounding adolescent sexuality and abortion may make adolescents fearful of negative parental response. In some instances, such a revelation about their sexual activity could result in violence at the hands of their parents 
or other family members. And further, if an adolescent girl facing an unwanted pregnancy does seek parental authorization for abortion services, her parents may simply refuse to provide consent, thereby depriving her of the right to make decisions about her sexual and reproductive health and human rights. For adolescents who are married, spousal consent laws may also be insurmountable barrier to accessing safe and legal abortion services. Married adolescents may be under a great amount of pressure to bear children in order to prove, prove their fertility to their husband and his family. In such instances, the adolescent girl may feel unable to discuss her decisions to terminate the pregnancy uh, with her spouse, as she may be seen as failing to fulfill her duty to bear children, and her spouse may even deny her permission to access services. So let me just conclude. Um, In order to fully realize the human rights of all women and girls, it's critical that states remove restrictive abortion laws as well as third-party authorization requirements for abortion services. States must also take positive measures to ensure adolescent girls exercise their sexual and reproductive rights, including the right to determine whether to carry a pregnancy to term. States should establish youth-friendly sexual and reproductive health services that empower adolescents to make responsible decisions about their sexual and reproductive health. Furthermore, states should adopt positive measures to eradicate the stigma surrounding abortion and adolescent sexuality, paying particular attention to how the stigma disproportionately hinders the realization of girls' human rights.